So I want to start by looking at the factorial function. And so you'll recall that the factorial function, say n factorial, uh, is defined like this. It's equal to n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 dot 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 all the way down to 1. So we're, we're taking every integer from 1 up to n and we're multiplying them all together and that's our factorial function. And we can plot that. And when we plot it, uh, here's what it looks like. It looks a bit like this. So I'll, I'll, I'll draw it like this. Here's our, here's our x and y. And so let's just plot this for a couple values of n. Uh, so what, what do we know? We know that uh, 1 factorial, uh, 1 factorial is 1. Uh, we know that 2, because uh, you know 1 times everything down to 1 is just 1. Uh, 2 factorial, well that's 2 times 1, so that's 2. Uh, what about 3 factorial? Well 3 factorial, you know, 3 times 2 times 1, that's going to be 6. Uh, what about 4 factorial? 4 factorial, well now it's starting to get large. So we have 4 times 3, which is 12, times 2 is 24. So we're already, we're already somewhere way up here. Um, but but you, can, you can see that, you know, this n factorial right here is sort of behaving like, kind of like an exponential, or, but actually a, a lot faster. Um, you know, as, 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 as x increases here, our factorial function is just blowing up on the y-axis. So that's the factorial function that you know and love. Uh, but now I'm going to ask a question that maybe you haven't thought of before, and that's this. What is, what is 3 halves factorial? What is, th what is this guy equal to? And, and does, does that even make sense, right? I mean, the way that we know the factorial function is that uh, it, it assigns to each integer value greater than 0 or greater than or equal to 0 uh, a, a value according to this definition right here. I mean, do we know what, what it means to plug 1 half into this definition? I mean, what, what, what is that, or like 3 halves into it? What does that look like? Um, well, I'm going to propose the following solution. I'm going to say this. What we can do in order to give a meaningful value to 3 halves factorial, and really anything factorial, um, in, in, order to, in order to extend the argument of the factorial function to a real valued or even complex valued number, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to interpolate, interpolate between the points of our factorial function. That, that's, that's what I'm going to do. And so this is, this is certainly one way of uh, defining the factorial function, saying that, um, all right, we're going to take our points um, that we are familiar with from the factorial function, and then we're just going to draw a, a, a curve through them. That, that's one way of extending the factorial function to non-integer values. Um, but, I mean, you might rightly complain that, well, wait a minute, there's more than one way to draw a curve through this. I mean, one, one thing that you could do is, you could, you, I mean, you could have just as well done something like this, maybe have something oscillate oscillate such that it still hits all the points um, but it does some weird stuff in between in, be, in between those points I mean and you can even draw stuff weirder than this uh, and so what what stops us from drawing a curve like that I mean how, how do we know what the right curve is to draw through those points well uh, the answer there is that uh, we need to enforce some extra properties and there's one property that uh, the factorial function has which is really important and that's that n factorial is equal to n times n minus 1 factorial. Uh, we, we like this property, right, because, uh, I mean, this is one of the most useful parts of the factorial function is that it's recursive in this way. And so that means, uh, and so what, what that suggests to us is that our, our generalization, the curve that we draw through these points should also satisfy this relationship, not, not just for... Uh, you know, integer choices of n, but for any value of real or complex n. Okay, so this turns out actually to not be enough to uniquely define this curve right here. You have to you have to enforce another um, another property called log convexity, which I, I don't want to go into here because that's that's a bit more math than than I think we need. Um, but uh, assuming both of those properties, you do get a unique curve right here. So so what is what what, what is that curve? Well, that curve which is called gamma of z, where, where z is our generalized n, that is equal to, now not a, not a nice function like we're familiar with, but an integral, an integral from zero to infinity of x 
to the z minus 1 e to the minus x dx. So here, uh, x is our dummy variable. We're integrating that guy out. And then we have our z dependence right here. Um, OK. So this is our definition of the gamma function. And the gamma function, the gamma function is our generalized factorial function. And it's related like this. Gamma of n plus 1 is equal to n factorial. And so that what that what that tells us is that you know for example if we want one factorial then we plug in gamma equal to uh, with you know z equal to two, if we want three factorial we put z equal to four, um, so this is a way that where we're, we recover both uh, both our normal factorial and also this extension where I mean this this z and this integral can be whatever value you want so long as the integral converges. Okay, the last thing I'll do here is just prove that this property is actually true for the, our gamma function here. So. For the gamma function, because we've because we've shifted things a little bit, the property is written like this: gamma of z plus one is equal to z gamma of z. So this is sort of a restatement of this property right here, um, but with that with that extra shift. Okay. Um, so how do we prove that this is true? Well, it's actually very uh, very straightforward, and I'll do it like this: um, gamma of z plus one that's equal to integral 0 to infinity x to the z e to the minus x dx. Um, OK, we can do integration by parts on this. And what we get is that if we integrate e to the minus x and differentiate uh, x to the z, then what we get is this. We get that our, our uh, boundary term is x to the z e to the minus x evaluated at the endpoints. And then our integral becomes this. It becomes plus z. So we take a derivative of x, pull down to z. Integral 0 to infinity uh, x to the z minus 1 times e to the minus x dx. And this right here is exactly equal to, exactly equal to z gamma of z. So just by doing integration by parts one time, uh, this property immediately popped out. So we know that uh, this gamma function right here does exactly what we want, want it to do based on our definition for the factorial function. Um, so I think I'll stop here. This right here, this, this is probably one of the most important special functions that you'll ever come across, the gamma function. Um, because uh, these weird, you know, three halves factorial, one half factorial, you know, ten halves factorial, those types of numbers come up quite a lot actually um, as you do more and more math and so being familiar with this function and knowing how to work with it and understanding its properties will be very important and so in the next couple of videos i'm going to start going into some of those properties and some related functions and looking at just how rich the behavior of this function really is i mean you really get a whole lot out considering that you're just starting from connecting the dots so i hope to see you in the next video